Welcome one and all to the fifth and final episode of Pregnant Talks 1.0. Before we get to the main topic, we'd like to give a big shout out to our media partners, Campusly and the Campus Media for making this episode possible. With the number of COVID-19 cases continuing to rise, the pandemic is far from subsiding. One of the most uncertain sectors in its wake, the education sector has been identified as one with an increasingly doubtful future. Job offers resented, international admits deferred, student visas temporarily suspended. All of this has added to a worrying environment full of confusion and unrest in students' minds. Discuss this in depth while providing us an insider's view into the topic. We have with us today one of the most eminent names in education, Dr. Shamitra Datta, is a professor of management and the former founding dean of the S.C. Johnson College of Business at Cornell University. Before this, he was on the faculty of INSEAD, a leading international business school. He's an expert in the domains where technology and business meet, specializing in the role of innovation in the knowledge economy. He's a distinguished entity in the field, having been invited to the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum at Davos for more than 10 years. We at Pragyan are incredibly honored to have him with us here today. Welcome, sir. So, Thank you. So, sir, to start off our interview, the first question. Uh, in your blog on GSBN, you had mentioned about leaders and deans from several universities having unanimously agreed that this might be a tipping point for the change in affairs for a whole lot of things. Education, by and large, is also a party to it. How has the pandemic affected the education system and how have educators around the world responded to this? And will this lead to the formation of a COVID generation as speculated by many around the world? And what do you think is the most rational way forward, keeping safety in mind as well? So thank you, Ashwin. Thank you, Anand. And thank you to the team for inviting me. Um, it's correct to say that we are living through an extraordinary time, especially in education. Uh, in education, we have had for a long time uh, changes, but the changes have been relatively minor. If you think about how even many classrooms are structured and how instruction is delivered, it goes back to the Greek system of amphitheaters and how people stood up in front of others and just communicated knowledge in a traditional format. Mm -hmm. That has worked very well, but I think what now finally education sector is realizing is the potential of technology to change that mode of transmission of knowledge. Uh, education has always used technology, but it was in small doses. I think what we have seen because of the pandemic is a large scale change and adoption of technology. Now, whenever you look at technology adoption, you know, people typically look at three phases. The first phase is substitution. You replace the old by the new technology. The second phase is diffusion. The technology gets used more and more because it is cheaper, better to use in some sense. And the third phase really is transformation. Well, fundamentally, new ways of living, working emerge. So what we have seen in education really is the first phase and a little bit of the second phase. So you know, we have moved our online, moved our traditional classes online. And yes, because of the pandemic, everyone has done it. Diffusion has taken place. But we haven't really seen the transformation. So I really think that the next five years of education are going to be truly trans transformative. And we'll see new ways of learning, blended learning and virtual learning and you know, in-class learning coming up, which will really force us to rethink what education means, how it is delivered and what learning means for students. So yes, a lot of changes are happening. How have universities and schools responded? I think on the whole, quite well. Uh, a lot of people previously thought this large scale migration was not easily possible and was probably impossible in the minds of many, but we have shown it is possible. And all this has happened in a very short time span, less than a month, sometimes even two weeks or less in some instances. So we have shown that we can change uh, and we've done it successfully. The big question mark in my mind is, can we actually now show we can experiment to create the best form of blended learning going forward? That's the question, because what we have today works only partially, doesn't work fully. So is there a COVID generation? Certainly there is, and I think the students are being uh, forced into the new learning environment. And my advice to students really is embrace it. Uh, you can't resist it. There's no point, you know, sitting and complaining that, well, you know, it, life used to be so good in the classroom and now we are being forced in this less good environment of the live virtual learning. But guess what? Embrace it and make it even a better environment. 
find ways to make it better. So I would suggest and encourage students and faculty to find ways to use this new circumstances to make learning even better. Thank you, sir. That was a fresh perspective of embracing what is happening and using it to our own advantage. Now, coming on to the next question. Right now, social distancing and lack of travel facilities coupled with an unequal distribution of technology and connectivity across the globe have made conducting exams, even the ones like SAD, GRE, etc., that can be taken online become a major hurdle. Over the past months, many universities have canceled the requirement of standardized tests like SAD GRE. So is there a possibility that other institutes will follow suit in this regard? Also, what other changes like the timeline, acceptance rate, etc., can be expected for the coming admission process? So, you know, this is all part of the rethinking that I said we all have to go through. Uh, it's not just the rethinking of what is taught in the classroom, but even the whole admissions process you know, and placement process and how we select students. And for a long time, we have assumed that the best way to select students is on the basis of exams, on the basis of uh, standardized you know, global tests and national tests. And they probably play some role. I'm not questioning that. But the question is, are they really the best uh, mechanism to choose people? and choose bright young people. So I think we have to question a lot of that. And what I assume is going to happen is a lot of experimentation is going to happen on this. As you know, many universities, as you correctly said, have said that you know, we will not use standardized tests any longer and we'll go to other kinds of mechanisms of choosing people. And I don't think the answer is out here as yet known. So no one knows exactly what's the right way to do so. But I think there's been a grand experiment, you know, in many countries, the national school leaving, school leaving exams have been canceled, you know, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, something that never happens in a once in a generation kind of a, or a once in a century kind of an effort or an event. So my own sense is that uh, there will be a lot of experimentation. And I would encourage uh, universities to really rethink the whole uh, assessment and certification procedures that we have used, you know, how we actually select students, how we certify them, how we assess the knowledge uh, acquisition, and how we interact with job placements. I think everything has to be rethought, but this rethinking has yet to happen. So, so as you mentioned, we'll move into placements as well. So with the suspension of the hedgeman we visa, uh, visa extension and the possibility for international students in terms of job prospects in the US, how can students who are already enrolled in the US cope up with the current situation? So it's a, very, it's a very challenging situation now for students who are already enrolled in American universities, the foreign students, to find jobs. And you know, this is only natural because even local American citizens are finding challenges in finding jobs because businesses are challenged. You know, all businesses are facing tremendous changes. So I think there's a whole cascade of effects that is taking place. And uh, some of it is obviously going to impact foreign students. Uh, how and what can you do? So I think the first thing that I recommend to foreign students and I tell students who come to talk to me is take a global perspective because many students come to the US and they strongly desire to work in the US, which I understand it's natural, you wanna work in the US, but I tell them, look, the world is a bigger place and it's important to look at global opportunities on a global basis. So look globally is the first piece of advice I give. And I know that the pandemic is affecting all countries. You know, usually you have economic crisis in one part, other parts of the world do well. This time somehow they, this pandemic is affecting all countries. So in some sense, the situation is pretty challenging uh, everywhere. But I think looking globally at least gives you more options. It uh, doesn't restrict you. Second, I always tell them, reach out to your network. Because one of the things you get is an education, a network of great alumni, uh, reach out a network of friends and family and anyone you know. Talk to people. I think that's very important uh, that you reach out to the network because you never know when someone has something that is interesting. 
The third thing that I suggest is, uh, you know, people often come and they have the expectation of a job offer, you know, a job at Microsoft or a job at Goldman Sachs or some kind of a high aspirational position. And I say, okay, you know, focus on learning as opposed to the company and the supposedly prestige associated with the company. And sometimes you can learn a lot in positions that you may not have thought of initially. Let's say, for example, you go into a not-for-profit organization and uh, you actually can learn a lot, even though you may not get a lot of money. Well, you may in fact get a very minimal amount of money, but uh, your learning can be very high. So I would say focus on learning as opposed to the title or the company brand and so on. Uh, the company brand can come later. You know, at three years time when things are you know, more stable and more normal, if you're good, you can get into a good company later on. There's always room for you in a good organization that you sought. But I would say focus on learning. And the last thing that I would tell people is that never lose that self-confidence. Because if you lose the self-confidence in yourself, if you start thinking that, well, you know, I'm not good enough and something is wrong with me, that's why I don't get a job. Uh, I think, you know, when you interview and you meet uh, companies or meet executives or meet uh, job uh, recruiters, they can tell immediately whether you're confident or not. And that self-confidence is very important. You need to have the confidence that yes, what is happening is globally unique. I know I did not create it, but guess what? No one knew it would happen. And I will embrace it once again. I will use as a challenge to you know build my own character, my own strength. And I will look forward to you know, being confident of my own capabilities. So that was wonderful. Your advice on focusing globally and not on money incentives, focusing on learning is good for our audience. So following the previous discussion, sir, you have taught for a long duration at INSEAD 2 before moving to the US. You have vast knowledge about the higher education setup across various continents. So for the students who are planning their applications for higher studies abroad, what could be the possible alternative to the US that can be ideal for an Indian student if the previously mentioned policies continue? Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be a challenging environment for students wanting to study abroad uh, in the next few years because of the pandemic, because situation that is, you know, all universities are stressed financially and otherwise around the world. Uh, the US is especially a little bit more challenging because of the policies adopted by the government, current government. The current government has taken a very nationalistic policy and that has made it even more challenging for students to, in fact, uh, study and, and, and get employment in, 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 in America right now. So my advice would be, of course, as I said earlier, and you said in your question, look globally. And globally, besides the US, there are some very good countries, very good education systems right now. Uh, clearly, in America, North America, you have Canada, you know, which is uh, very welcoming right now. Canada is very welcoming. It's mainly English speaking, so it is very actually good. Uh, UK has become much more better right now with Brexit and so on. Uh, UK has revamped this whole immigration point policy and essentially now all students are able to work in the UK much more easily after graduation. So that's something to look at. Uh, and I always encourage people to look at uh, Europe. You know, I think because of language, uh, a lot of Indians don't look at continental Europe seriously. And I lived and worked in France for many years, and I know Europe uh, quite well. And I'd say there are excellent schools in Germany, in Finland, in Sweden, in uh, Holland, in France, in Spain. And, so, and, and me, many people might be surprised to hear this, but not only are these schools very good, but many of them are completely free for foreign students, or in most cases, have a very small fee. So I think the value versus price ratio in, in many European schools is extremely high. Uh, so it's of course very good if you get into Stanford and MIT, but not everyone gets in Stanford and MIT or Cornell. So, but if you are looking to get a good education, let's say for example, a top school in Switzerland like EPFL in engineering or ETH in Zurich, is they're excellent schools, about the best in the world. And somehow they're not known in, among Indian students. Indian students tend to focus mainly on English, you know, Anglophone countries. So my encouragement to students in uh, India would be look outside the traditional Anglophone countries. And there are some great jewels to be found in Europe. 
And if you're really adventurous, uh, you really want to be adventurous, I would say, look at China. Uh, I know that China is a controversial choice right now, but the reality is the Chinese economy is massive and it's the second biggest global power in the world. And the impact of China in the world is going to be very, very high. And uh, amongst Indians, especially in India, the knowledge of China is very low, okay, because historical animosity and the traditional problems we've had in the two countries, knowledge of China is very low. And most Indians don't actually understand what modern China is like today. And modern China is extremely sophisticated, extremely advanced in many ways. And the Chinese culture is a very important one in business. Just like you have to understand the American culture in business, the Chinese culture in business also is very important. So if you're really adventurous, I would say, look at Chinese. There are many Chinese universities now are welcoming foreign students, uh, very similar in policy to what the Americans did. You know, many years ago, Americans welcomed American foreign students in the American universities. And Chinese universities are following the same policy as a soft power policy of making more people aware of Chinese uh, uh, culture and Chinese uh, policies. So I think, you know, uh, going to China is not necessarily a completely crazy choice right now. Yes, sir. So as you rightly mentioned, looking global beyond just the Anglophone countries is definitely something that people can look into. So speaking of global, the pandemic has brought global travel to a screeching halt. So except for essential travel, many students who are supposed to join their universities this fall are conflicted so as to whether they should defer the same or continue with the online classes. So what would be your advice to these students with no certainty over when safe travel could be permitted again? What should their strategy be, if any? So for students who have admission to programs in foreign countries, uh, my advice would be to defer for one year. Uh, mainly because I think there is a high degree of uncertainty about whether the universities will actually be able to offer in-person classes. Uh, many of them claim to offer in-person classes right now because they are worried about losing students en masse, so they're trying to encourage students to come back to campus. But my own sense is, especially given the kind of increase in cases in the U.S. happening right now, it's extremely unlikely that there'll be many online, I'm sorry, many in-person classes in America, or not in America, especially uh, right now. So if you are admitted to an American university, I would say think seriously about deferring. If you're going to other parts of the world, let's say Europe, where things are more under control, you could actually go. I think you can make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. Many European universities will in fact open up. Uh, and Europe, I think, has the disease under more control. Uh, the virus and the more control. Uh, so I think uh, Europe, I would take it on a case by case basis. I think I would, I would consider going to Europe, let's put it this way, on a case by case basis. But if you don't go, let's say to American University this year and you take a gap year, I would strongly suggest that you don't waste the year. You know, one year in the big picture of life, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so this is, uh, doesn't really matter. Use that year for enriching yourself in ways in which you perhaps have not done so to, so far. Uh, uh, you know, this could be taking courses online. There are plenty of excellent courses on Coursera and edX and other MOOCs, you know, providers. Uh, you could also engage in social service. You could actually work and learn. So, you know, don't just waste your time playing video games or doing other kinds of, you know, online surfing. I would say use it to build yourself and become more of an adult. You know, essentially, university is a very important time when you move from being you know, a teenager into a ad young adult. I think that transformation is very important. So use this time to help the transformation and transformation not just only around academics. Academics is a small part of it. Transformation is about life, about how you connect society, how you actually help others, how you engage in societal projects. So I would say India gives a lot of opportunities for people to do socially useful things. And these kind of uh, efforts actually are valued by universities abroad. So uh, they are not something that people will say, okay, you wasted your time. No, people actually say you used your time effectively. And I think that's something which is very important. That was nice, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, based on your perspective of in in-person classes and you told um, not to attend these classes if they're in American or like Harvard University recently announced a 
completely online mode for next semester, but they kept the fees as same as usual. Many students and professionals have argued that as most of the on-campus experiences are not available via a virtual class, such high fees are unreasonable. Being a former dean and current professor at Cornell University, which is an Ivy League institution and one of the most sought-after colleges, you'd like to know your take on this topic, sir. Yes, yeah, so obviously you understand I don't represent Cornell University. These are my own personal views. Okay, so I just want to qualify that uh, initially. And of course, the decisions at any university are made by the president of the university. Uh, I think it's a controversial and important topic. Uh, I understand that many universities, because of budget pressures, want to maintain the tuition fees. But I think it is only correct and ethical if the fees are reduced, mainly because the learning experience is not the same as before. Uh, the experience you get in a university context essentially represents a combination of knowledge and the social experience, you know, whether it's uh, clubs or whether it's sports or other kinds of informal uh, gatherings or activities you have. And a lot of that is not easily possible today. And now, having said this, if some universities make the effort to move a lot of the social extracurricular activities uh, to the degree possible online, then that's a different story. But if you just only move your, you know, your academic lectures online and charge the same tuition, that I don't think is a correct and a fair deal for students. Uh, but I just emphasize once again, this is my personal uh, point of view. And of course, I don't represent Cornell's point of view in this. So, sir, you had mentioned previously about how if you decide to defer this particular year, then that time has to be used, utilized effectively. And professional certificate courses on Coursera or edX have seen a tremendous increase in the last six months because of this reason. So, students can enroll and take part in courses taught by professors from reputed universities from the comfort of their home. But Coursera has made the entire access to its catalog is free. And so, there's a fresh debate about education democracy as a whole. So will we see such online professional courses replacing the traditional ones anytime soon? So this is all part of the transformation. Remember I talked about substitution, diffusion, transformation. So the transformation of education is, hasn't as yet happened. Uh, if you think about traditionally what a university does, it does you know, three things essentially from a knowledge point of view. Of course, it does social, of course, sports and all of other kinds of extracurricular activities. But from a knowledge point of view, it creates and delivers knowledge. It does an assessment of knowledge. You have exams and other things to assess knowledge. You learn the knowledge. And it does certification. It gives you a degree or some kind of certification that the job market values. Now, it is not clear that a university should keep on doing all three. If, for example, let's assume that the knowledge component is opened up uh, and you say that, well, you can learn your knowledge from any source. It doesn't have to be from the professor or teacher on the campus, but can be from Coursera at your own pace and you do it yourself. Uh, that causes a lot of questions for universities because universities have to now say that, do I actually need to have so many professors on my faculty roles? Do I need to pay the salaries of so many faculty in, you know, in my university? Uh, you know, what are some of the implications of the decision opening up knowledge? It's an interesting question. Uh, if you think about assessment and you ask the question, today universities mainly assess the students who are enrolled in a university. So only you can assess the students who are currently enrolled. But suppose I say, well, look, I open up the assessment to anyone. Any student wants to come and say, check whether I have the knowledge in subject A. And if I have the knowledge, if I pass the exams, just give me the certificate that I have knowledge in the subject. And today universities are not doing it, but suppose you do it. It again introduces a whole different notion of who's the student community. I talked about the faculty, then who's the student body of the university? Is it just students who are enrolled or is it anyone who comes to the student and just gets a certification? So it has implications for even the alumni, the student community of a university. So what I'm just trying to give you a sense for is that a lot of fundamental questions have to be asked about uh, what a university looks like, what are its functions, what does it do, what is scope and reach. And a lot of these questions have not been asked. So, you know, we have operated in a 
fairly vertically integrated model of university so far. And I think it's going to get uh, opened up. I think a lot of opening is going to happen. A lot of innovation, experimentation is going to happen in the way universities are structured and run in the future. Thank you, sir. So we have talked about students who are, uh, who are studying for higher studies, who are striving for higher studies, who are currently enrolled in these institutions. But coming on to the people who have graduated and got job, job offers, many were rec rescinded and layoff, uh, layoffs were there. Mainly management and analytics were the two domains that have been severely affected. And the closure of services like travel, logistics and hospitality, uh, this is not certainly helping the cause. Examples include organizations like Gartner, who globally rescinded all graduate hirings this year. As a professor of and leading pro, uh, professional in the field of technology and management, how do you see the future playing out? I, I, you know, I'm not too concerned about uh, most areas, but mainly because what we are seeing is a very sharp downturn in some specific areas. Um, yes, travel, hospitality, you know, hotels, airlines will be impacted for quite some time. No question about that. And quite some time could be two years, could be five years. We don't really know exactly. You know, key people today think that habits are going to change and people will not go to hotels. But think back about, you know, in 9-11, when you had the planes uh, hitting the towers in New York City, a lot of people said, you know, after this, people will not fly anymore. People will be scared of travel. But, you know, flying decreased for a year or two. And then once again, people started flying a lot. So it's hard to say exactly how people's behaviors will change, you know, whether it's permanent or not, because, uh, you know, people have short memories. People tend to forget. So, uh, so I think in terms of whether you, you know, fundamentally people like to travel, and so there's always a risk sort of value benefit you make, okay? When you travel to an exotic location, you go to the Himalayas or something, you know there's a risk of something going wrong, but you still go there because you like to go there. So I think as soon as people make a more, you know, collective assessment of risk versus return, I think the travel will return. I, I'm, for example, spending a few months in Europe and I see in Spain and France, you know, people are already coming back. Uh, you know, they're coming back, they're being more careful, but, you know, they want to actually spend the summer and I see people in restaurants and I see people in hotels and so on. So I think people are coming back and people are making their own judgment about the level of risk. You know, there's a risk associated with taking a plane, risk associated with driving a car and the risk associated with going to a restaurant right now. So people are making the judgment of the risk versus a value. So I think people will make the judgment, but having said this, in areas like analytics and IT, I think, you know, my own sense is jobs are going to keep on growing. They're going to explode because the demand is so high. Uh, data is exploding. Uh, you know, you need analytics skills to help manage the data, analyze the data. So I don't see any recession in IT jobs. Now, clearly, some of the IT companies have done very well in this uh, crisis. But in general, I think anyone with technology skills and good analytical skills and even management skills uh, will do well. You know, there will be a short term downturn and in maybe income and jobs, but I would not be too concerned about it. Um, I think, you know, uh, in this sectors, the economy will rebound very quickly if it has not done so already and people will find jobs. In some other sectors, people's behaviors might take a little bit more time to come back, but then we don't know exactly how they'll revert to it. But certainly in terms of um, corporate, uh, let's say, uh, uh, approaches, some things will change because now companies have found that productivity is not diminished by having people work from home. And as soon as companies now discover that they don't need the office space, they will move to cut costs. So I think you know there will be pressure because of ways to cut costs from companies to keep pushing on some ways of remote working in the years in the years forward. So I think there will be some pressures that companies will uh, put on changing things, and we'll have to wait and see how often uh, you know how quickly do people come back to some of the hospitality industries, 
But I'm actually not too pessimistic. I'm actually cautiously optimistic that we'll recover from this relatively, you know, uh, relatively soon. I don't think it's going to be a structural problem in recovery. So, sir, like you said, there is not going to be a major downturn over the long run in technology. So, in technology, innovation obviously plays a very, very major role. And you've always rated innovation to be something very high through your impactful and thorough reports, such as the Information Technology Report and the Global Innovation Index. And evidently, the pandemic calls for a rethink of, rethinking of the way we live and do business. So with the AI hype and the move towards automation, how do you see innovation happening in the next few couple of years? Will there be a stalling due to a stump in the economy or would it be pick up further? Yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, I was the founder of the Global Innovation Index. You know, you can look at the work just by searching online for Global Innovation Index. The website is globalinnovationindex.org. And we study innovation across countries for many years now. And uh, what we have seen is, you know, historically, the rates of investment innovation ran parallel, roughly mirrored the GDP growth rates. So GDP rates sort of influence the innovation rates. Now, the last crisis happened in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis. And what we have seen is that since that last crisis, there has been a divergence, divergence in terms of innovation rates actually increased at a faster rate than GDP growth rates. So investment innovation actually has not decreased, has increased since the last crisis and increase at a rate faster than the GDP growth. And a lot of that has happened because the private sector has increased its innovation investments uh, in digital technologies. So digital technologies have really increased in, you know, in, in, in the range of possibilities they afford. And as a result, uh, the private sector has really leveraged that very strongly. And uh, what will happen going forward is interesting. There's some question marks about it, of course. People fear the innovation investment spending will decrease, but I am actually quite uh, positive that, uh, quite optimistic that innovation rates will not decrease because technology will keep on increasing exponentially with technology improvements. There'll be new ways of doing things and private sector and government will have to invest to take advantage of those things. Look at, for example, remote working right now. You know, uh, There's so much investment happening in coming up with new technology systems like Zoom, like you know, GeoMeet, like other kinds of systems to come up with you know, how can technology support uh, remote working and remote living. So I think innovation will happen. I think innovation will continue. And I remain optimistic that we will not see a decline in, op in innovation that is uh, anything substantial. There might be a very short blip, but that will be a very short blip. Thank you, sir. That was, that was a wonderful perspective. So coming on to uh, rise of digital technology and all, you've uh, seen increasing adoption of automation in corporates and all, and a work from home culture is also improved. The CEO of Quora, for instance, has recently announced that their employees will operate remotely from now. So how do you think students and professionals affected by this tackle this problem? Also, what will be the change in hiring practi uh, practices, new career options, and what will be the required skill sets for the post-pandemic era? So these are all very good questions. And what I would say is that we are discovering what the answer is, you know, so we don't know exactly what the, all the answers are, but I think what we are discovering are, you know, there have been some surprises also in this whole uh, working at home. A lot of people have said that they have discovered their families, you know, their spouses, the children, and hadn't spent time with their spouses and children for so many years, you know, that much time. Uh, so many people have discovered that actually it is quite pleasant to be able to have the freedom to work from home and not be stuck to a routine. Because keep in mind the current office structure and the current routines of going in at a certain time and leaving at a certain time is all linked to the industrial revolution when people set up factories and factories, machines were in one location, people had to come to work on the machines and then the managers had to come in to manage the workers in the machines. So there was this whole notion of coming to one location for the machines coming in a certain time and leaving a certain time. 
And all that has now been opened up. The people have actually realized that we can live and work quite effectively uh, without doing any such you know, traditional notions of coming together and being together in one location. So this whole idea that you have to be same time, same place has been really questioned and large scale. And we will see changes definitely. And as I told you, you know, the our notion of office space will be changed. Uh, the notion of travel will be changed. I can speak for myself. I used to travel extensively. I used to travel extensively. Now I used to go to you know, fly from New York to Sao Paulo, uh, give a talk and then fly back the next day. You know, I used to do crazy things like that. And I, now I look at it and say, you know, this was crazy to fly 12 hours and fly back just for staying there less than a day. And uh, because there's bad on the health, bad on the environment, uh, bad in every single way and you have jet lag and everything else. So now people will say, well, guess what? I don't have to travel 12 hours. Let's do it by video. You know, look, look at this session we're having right now. I don't have to come to India. I can travel. I can, we can have a good session like this. So I think people will rethink and people will accept a different way of living and working. And as that spreads, you know, what kind of practices will require? What kind of skills will require? How will you build the emotional skills? Because one thing that people say when you go to office, you build the emotional bonds between people more easily. Now, if you're doing more and more of your work remotely like this, you know, how do you build that emotional bond? So I think you know, we have to discover what are the ways to do it. And we know that uh, you know, emotional bonds can be built uh, online too. You have uh, uh, lots of successful communities where people are very close to each other and online communities, for example. So we have to try to find ways and learn from these successful communities and adapt different techniques and that'll require different skills. So I think this whole, this area of skills, practices and you know, hiring and all this thing is going to be questioned and rethought in the coming, uh, let's say, uh, days and weeks. So as we come towards the conclusion of this particular interview, what kind of advice would you have for our young audience who would be willing to upskill? What do you think that they should focus on in the time years coming forward? Think about how lucky you are and what an incredible point in history you actually, you know, currently as a young person. And to just think about it more concretely, compare yourself to your parents or ask your parents how the world looked like when they were your age. And today, most young people have so much more access to more information, so many new opportunities about what is happening in the world. And that is, I think, something, a privilege. So the challenge really for a lot of young people is how do you take the privilege and do the responsible thing? Responsible to yourself and responsible, of course, to your family and society at large. Uh, keep in mind that, of course, you have to do the best you can. So, you know, you have to work hard, you have to get a good job, you have to do all the things that people tell you you have to do. But as you do so, you also have to make the world a better place. And I say this not because saying, you know, make the world a better place is nice to say or it's a fashionable thing to say, because if you do not do so, I think the world will really be a much worse place for your children, the next generation. I think, you know, our generation, my generation has failed in many ways. You know, we haven't actually <clears throat> succeeded in making the world a better place in many ways. And you know, our environment is much worse off than when I was younger. And I think cities have become much worse in India compared to when you know, I was younger. So I think uh, the current generation has failed in many aspects, not all, but many aspects. And I think the current younger generation, people like you, should be looking at the bigger goals too, not just only your personal goals of getting a good job and a good salary, which are important, I'm not denying that, but also look at the bigger goals of how do you make India a stronger country? How do you make India society a better place? Uh, how do you help the so many millions of poor Indians who don't have uh, education, don't have you know, good health and other kinds of basic amenities? So to a degree you can help, I know that you cannot change everything as a single person, but if everyone makes a change in a meaningful way, the country can actually become much better. So be conscious of how lucky you are, how privileged you are. Be happy for all the opportunities you have and be determined to use your skills to make the world a better place. That's 
my advice to young people like right uh, like you right now thank you sir that was an amazing message for everyone out there and also it was an absolute pleasure discussing the future of education in the post covid scene the share your insights would be highly valuable to every one of our viewers who are who are, who need a much much needed clarity and direction to community that has been anxious thank you sir thank you very much and good luck finally we like to once again thank our media partners campus lee and the campus media for making this video series possible thank you